Okay. Yes. Okay. So, Yam. Jam. Jam. Mm -hmm. So you you looked up how to pronounce it. Jam. Nope. Batista Vico, mm -hmm. Italian humanist philosopher, historian. I am fascinated by him. Absolutely fascinated by him. I am sad that I had never heard of him before. And as I read him, he just resonated with me so much. I'm like, oh, he gets it. He gets it. Because I mean, I just like he's as I read, especially the first oration, I'm like, he's he's noticing the milestones the inner logic of things he gets it like he really gets it i'm 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 slightly obsessed Slight, slightly obsessed well it's amazing i loved looking at in the introduction where they were talking about how he wasn't found until the romantic period and ah. then the people who admired him i was like oh i like those people and they yeah. all are within the realm that realm of imagination yeah. and the importance of that and mm -hmm. The beauty of words that made me happy. Oh. I liked seeing that and who had been affected by him. Oh, yeah, the line of Vico tried to hold on to imagination and memory in a world increasingly preoccupied with truncated reason. Gosh, Trun truncated. I mean, even just Gamble's insertion of that word, I feel like is so important because there's reason that is valuable but it's what you've talked about in the past mm -hmm. the truncated almost like judgment making before actually small mind question oh that, yeah. yeah yeah great so connection like, like the it just basically is making and jumping to those conclusions the truncated reason it doesn't have the fullness of the seeking of the right. truth yes, anyway that's what it, it made it me jumps think to the conclusion or stops short it's just the the judgments and mm -hmm. the jumping to conclusions not really following it through so good yeah so we can read this however or we can actually read some passages if you want but i have to tell you that this time when i went through uh -huh. to write my little notes in it i actually decided i was going to um you always encourage us to look at it and notice things wonder things and reminds me of things so i decided to put n1 and then i would write my n1 on my like a little line about what i was thinking when i said ah. i noticed it or like w1 for my first wonder and then i'd write my question actually down so i went through that and it was actually really helpful because <gasps> i often will read things that say oh this reminds me of this but then i and so i put a little star or something but then i don't remember it later i'm like oh my gosh i'm familiar so, so this is so bad. helpful Oh, that's so awesome. Yes. I want to hear all of those. And I just want to pause for a second and like point out how powerful that is, especially for people listening to the recording, because what you just said is what's happening in our students when they resist writing down what they writing down what they wonder. So this is why when I'm coaching you guys about um, coaching students with reading and coaching the, what do I notice? What do I wonder? What does it remind me of? All that comes out of your mouth. And when you're coaching a student in this is, hey, when you have that moment where something crosses your mind or moves through your mind and, and you, you have to capture it right then and, and honor it because so many things happen in that moment. And you, I would like to hear from you what was happening in that moment and what you've done before and what was different this time. Uh, because what normally happens is they'll judge themselves. They'll think it's not important or they'll just not even pay it attention. They'll just be about the task and move on and not give it space and credence and whatever else. And so they pass the moment by, they don't capture it. And then the moment is lost. And, and what's so amazing to me is that most of the time when we have these fleeting thoughts, what do I notice? What do I wonder? What does it remind me of? They're important. They're significant. They matter to the text. They're not just made up dumb stuff that we, you know, or just think, you know, pretending that matters, but doesn't like they're where our souls, our, our minds are noticing something. Mm -hmm. So all of that. So yes. So when we are teaching our students to notice it, we have to like over the top emphasize that like no pay attention to your thinking which is mm -hmm. by the way the foundation of all logic study and mm -hmm. you know the foundation of um, well all the language arts but unless you're 
thinking about your thinking is logic. And then we do that in more nuanced ways, but it's all the, yeah. So I just wanted to rail on that for a minute because that is so so good. I agree with you. And I actually, I also think that it humanizes the reader. Mm -hmm. It tells you, you are valuable. You are having thoughts. You are receiving this. You are thinking and your thoughts are important. And not only that, but as a Christian, God tells you to think on those things, think on those beautiful things. So don't just ignore your thoughts, like think on them and recognize them. I just listened to a podcast where not a podcast, but a teaching where Josh Gibbs is talking about that and how um, the art of silence and then the art of actually thinking on something that is something that as Christians was a, a command and was something new. It wasn't just about your your rhetoric and just speaking all the time. There was a yeah. an importance there to be quiet and then also to think like God calls us to think on the good and the true and the beautiful, basically. And that like to notice your thinking and write it down. It says you are human and your thoughts are important. Yes. And all that reminds me of Psalm eight. Who is man that God should be mindful of him? God made him a lower, a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. Like we matter and not because we did anything to matter, but because God decided we mattered and crowned us with glory and honor. Mm, Good stuff. I love it. So, so tell me, what did you notice? Okay. Well, the first thing that I noticed my number one notice with a heart by it was that his father was a bookseller. And that made me so happy. Like he had a literary life from the time he was a child and his father encouraged him to read widely. And I feel like that is so much of my desire as a as a homeschooling mom is to encourage just that love of reading and the the wide variety and that it was just modeled for him. I'm sure his father was reading as well. Plus, he's a bookseller. And that makes me happy. That's really good. That makes me think of that first paragraph in the oration like the difference between it didn't I didn't think of the connection between those two until you just said that but I wonder how that experience of him growing up was different than what he's describing in that first paragraph of the mm. oration number six where parents mm-hmm. imposing their will on students yes I bet they had different conversations he was invited I bet into that great conversation rather than like you're gonna do this or that mm-hmm. and that's interesting so the next thing that I want, my first wondering question was in that same paragraph. And it said that he was a professor of rhetoric specializing in the Latin authors. So what does that look like back in the day? What does being a rhetoric teacher look like? Mm, okay, so it would have been Aristotle. Mm-hmm. It would have been the canons of rhetoric. It, they would have started with the pro mata, those exercises, and then they would have gone into studying the different discourses, the modes of persuasion, ethos, pathos, logos, and then the three different um, discourses, judicial. So Jewish prudence, the, yes, I saw the that. judicial discourse there, um, which is, and then there's the deliberative and then there's the ceremonial. So the judicial, discourse is looking at a past action. So it's past oriented. Imagine being in a courtroom, jury, judicial, all of that, and judging a past action, whether it was just or not. And if it wasn't, whether it should be punished or not, all of that. Uh, A deliberative, think Senate, think speeches, whether we should do something in the future, adopt a belief, have a certain policy, you're going to see that in in that realm. The judicial is future oriented about what is some course of action or belief or something that we should adopt or take some course of action we should take. And ceremonial is either praising or um, the opposite of praising somebody. And um, for example, the most famous or commonly commonly used example for ceremonial would be Pericles funeral oration. So most commonly you would see uh, ceremonial addresses at funerals and weddings. Uh, War speeches are common ceremonial addresses as well. They're meant to be inspiring. The most common modern iteration of a ceremonial address would be the modern day sermon. Um, It has similarities to the ceremonial address as well. But um, so that classical rhetoric are those three addresses 
And then the five cannons oriented towards that particular address to then invent, arrange, elocute it, make it eloquent, and then memorize it and uh, deliver it. So the performance. Um, and in the actual classes, I don't know if they're similar to what we have an understanding of in university. Was it, would he be literally like um, sharing spe these speeches aloud? Like, would he be reciting them or would there be a combination of that and discussion with his pupils, et cetera? That's a good question. Just curious. I haven't read a ton about stuff. Um, I haven't read a ton of examples of like actual classroom experiences from ancient times, but the part, usually I read them as secondhand accounts, like in Plato's dialogues, they'll be like, you know, or, um, or what other people have said about it. So I haven't read primary documents direct that many. Um, but from what I gather, the end of it was of course, in at least in ancient Greece, was the polis. Like this is where you go, or the you know the assembly. This is where you go to make decisions, and then in Rome, you know where everyone gathered to make decisions to argue for and against something. But in class, you would have been practicing all of this. One common thing. Well, this wasn't more. This wasn't until Aquinas, I think. But they used something called the disputed question, and they would practice. Um, looking at an argument and looking at both sides and then offering a third alternative. And so there's a lot of playing with studying arguments, looking at both sides of an argument and creating your own. So a lot of playing with this sort of thing. Um, and then, of course, you know, the real thing comes when you're in the polis um, or the assembly. Or something. Does that answer your question? It does, because I I'm curious about what it actually would have been like. Not because I'm trying to mimic or recreate it, but oh, more just be. out of Hello. sheer curiosity <laughs> about what did that look like, you know? And I yeah. think it'd be neat to be the fly on the wall in so some of those I things. So I feel like I think about that a lot. So we have, we obviously have Plato's. Um, we have, sorry, we have Plato's dialogues. We also have Aristotle's rhetoric and poetics. We have um, uh, okay. We have several other. I, um, what's his name? I have it right here. I just got it. I'm excited. I'm sorry. Then we have. I just got this. The rhetorical exercises of Nikiforos uh, Basilake. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm butchering his name, but he has the most complete version of the Progenismata actually what he did in class. And like, when I read through this, it's really just him reiterating the story, like giving the example and then they do it. Like giving the example and then they do it over and over again. So there's not like this insanely involved lesson. And so, and then like, for example, in Aristotle's rhetoric, he's talking about the different elements. He'll, he'll go in on some topic about explaining something, pointing out something, naming something, talking about it. But there's not like a lesson plan necessarily like we see in modern day curriculum. This is another reason why my mind has gravitated towards the five realms the way that it has, as I thought about how do you actually teach classically? Because they didn't really have something like, we're gonna do a Socratic dialogue or a mimetic sequence now. Nobody talked like that back then. They just did stuff. So what were they doing? What were they noticing? What were their lessons like? So if we can like reverse engineer all the things one could do in a lesson in a classroom, and we are deeply concerned with the nature of things, the nature of how someone learns, the nature of our subject. And even uh, Vico points this out in the first paragraph of oration. He says, um, he's talking about the knowledge we have the constitution of the children, uh, discerning native talents. Like there's all this language about discernment and noticing, kind of like we talk about the mindfulness of the classical teacher. I, the more I study pedagogy and learning, the more I believe that classical pedagogy is a lot of things, but it's 
these different roles and leaning to whatever's needed in the moment with deep discernment and wisdom and experience. Like, I don't think there's like the ancient Greek pedagogy and this is what everyone did. Here's the method they use. There isn't that. There's wisdom and experience and looking at the natures of things, the nature of things and leaning into different analogies. And uh, it's so much more complex, which can make it feel unreachable. But I don't think there is a straight answer for what happened in the classroom. I think the master teachers that I have seen, they dance between all the roles. They dance between all the different things that one could teach, coaching skills, presenting knowledge, setting up the scenario, um, inquiring into truth, like being mindful of what's going on, knowing when, like, look at lady philosophy and how she discerns what Boethius needs in the moment, whether he's feeling sorry for himself and just needs a kick in the pants or like homeboy's really in pain and he needs the balm of Gilead. Like she can tell, but how do you tell? Oh, experience and discernment. So I know that's not really a great answer <laughs> in the sense that it, I mean, it doesn't give, there's not, there's not an equation. I, um, I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, but that's what feels like the right answer to me in response to that question, because it's the five realms and the practice of mindfulness. That is what I believe. You know, everything that you just said reminds me of Charlotte Mason's 20 principles that mm -hmm. it's more about the principles than the actual method and mm -hmm. so you, it may look a lot of different ways in the classroom in a in a math session with your child but it is more about sticking to those principles and let them be your guide your guide and so I what I hear you saying is that the framework that you've kind of set up that works for you and um, enabled as a way to communicate these principles, mm -hmm. that is like the principle, those, that is the principles. Those are the thing your guiding things are to remember that you, you do go from one role and then you go to another role and when it's needed, then you step into the other place and being able, and I feel like that in and of itself, that, that um, discernment, or the noticing those types of things those in themselves are more like the those principles similar to charlotte what charlotte mason was talking about well that feels like a huge compliment <laughs> yeah, good job <laughs> but i will okay so i will say there's also more than just the principles like in the sense that one of the things that can feel overwhelming when you're learning to notice things is like, well, what would I notice? Like, how would I, you know? And so like, when you're looking at the, the realms, you're, there's different questions you can ask yourself. So for example, if I'm learning to notice different things, well, we know the mentor presents knowledge, the coach coaches skills, the, the philosopher inquires into truth, the host is setting up the environment. Like, so there's different questions. So then when you're watching your student, you can be asking, are they missing knowledge? Is there something they don't know? Is there a skill they don't have? Are they struggling with the skill? Are they miss like, is there an idea that they're just not getting? Or um, did I not give them enough time to read? Uh, is there a structural logistical thing that's a problem? So now all of a sudden you have particular questions you can ask yourself to help you discern while you're honing your internal plumb line for observing and discerning and that sort of thing, which then the, the experienced teacher kind of like goes through those questions automatically. But that's why they're also helpful because it doesn't leave you in the dark, just being like, okay, figure it out. Maybe one day when you're a 20 year teacher, you'll have a good moment. You know, it's like, no, you can actually like practice particular questions now. I think that's so helpful. And I do remember you giving us, I think, at the very beginning from the first weekend, some of those, ran not random, um, but some of those examples of those questions. Um, for me, I feel like personally, and that's kind of what I was thinking of, I guess, the other day when I was asking you about reminder posters, but I almost feel like maybe as a teacher, as a start of my day, I almost mm -hmm. need a personal catechism or a personal liturgy Ooh. or prayer that might help me focus and remember those things before I get into the actual teaching itself. Um, because such I, my brain is just all over the place. And 
I don't know if other people just naturally are able to make those connections, like to remember to do those things or to notice things while they're actually teaching a lesson. But I'm usually so focused on either whatever we're reading aloud or the lesson that I forget. Mm. I for, and that's what I sa was saying about having a little post or something. I need to be reminded that it's more than just the content um, that well, we're actually really doing, reading. A catechism for teachers. Well, and I could also then see because I'm, I'm what immediately while you're sharing, I'm thinking, well, what are the scenarios when you're asking those questions? Usually you ask those questions when something's not going right, like they're not getting it. So almost like the way, same way you would assess a student on the assessment or just even a bookmark or something. It's like when things feel like there's resistance or something here, are the questions to ask myself, like, what is going on? Like, how do I assess this situation? Um, like, yeah, because those are the times you would ask it, you would ask it when there's problems or things don't feel like they're going right. And then you would ask it at uh, normal intervals where you're reflecting on your year or the quarter or the lesson or whatever I mean like okay how did that go those are the two times you ask those kind of questions so there would need to be one for in the moment probably a bookmark and then maybe like some sort of planning routine that included those questions I could see like that being really helpful um so this kind of goes on to that but how have you actually done, a, are we, you, I think you said you talked about, uh, or that we will be talking about planning and things like that for the next yeah. year. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you have like an idea or, or have already put together documents on planning in general. No, it or was, review um, the planning review. was going to be a little bit more loose because we've already talked about the planning structure, which is like overview of the year. So that, that movement from overview of the year to the lesson. So we've talked about the form. So I was just going to go over that again and then offer reverse engineering workshop time for anyone that wanted to reverse engineer parts of their year that was feeling like, I don't know where I, this is what I want to create, but I don't know how to create it. So, so I was going to zero in on particular examples driven by you all. Um, but I, I mean, because I've honestly already shared my framework for how I plan. And really, it's just examples, which I feel like people learn better with examples anyway. So, yeah, that makes sense. And now that you say that, I can recall mm -hmm. all of those hard, I mean, documents that you work mm -hmm. so hard to create for us. And I, so many, and I then it makes me re refine my question to think about like um, more of a review or taking time to stop or whenever you do it at the end of the week, end of the term or whatever, mm -hmm. to kind of reassess and then commemorate, remember. Mm. Just as a teacher, not necessarily for your students, but just made me think like in the same way we put so much into planning. Mm -hmm. I just really to like wonder. I'm making notes. Hold on, you've given me so many ideas. I'm like, oh, we're gonna create that and we're gonna create that. <laughs> And we're going to create that. <laughs> it's mostly out of my own desperation. I, I love like it. All this stuff is so good, but how am I going to remember and implement? It's, and I do like the spirit does lead you because I do get reminded. Yes, they, they, um, exactly. Yes. I feel like there's a sort of, I feel like we have a similar personality a little bit, um, maybe a lot. I don't know. I mean, I'm still getting to know you, but um, oh, I, for me, it feels like everything is so great. I want to remember it all now and implement it all now, now, like now. And, and I sometimes feel dismayed that I'm like, I feel like it's slipping through my fingers. I can't hold it all. And, and I understand that feeling. And I think it's fitting and normal and right to just choose something and allow, as you said, the spirit to lead, because there are so many things you could grab onto, you know, and maybe, maybe is I shouldn't present as much as I do. And, you know, that will be a refining in the future if <laughs> that's part of it. But I also think in the meantime, it's okay to just give ourselves permission to choose the one thing, you know, like, I think it's important to present the frameworks in the beginning because it gives overarching categories that hold all the things but then we can just work on one thing too. And that's okay. Like that matters. Like just focus on the unit you're on, on the lesson you're on. And that's good enough. I think that sounds good. Like the first thing that comes to my mind when you, 
when I hear you say that is what we I discussed was my challenge earlier was just narration, just practice it, exactly. practice narration. If that's the one thing, even over the course of a year that we work on, mm -hmm. well, in addition to your normal subjects yeah. and things like that, but that one skill, if you will, then I feel like that would be a win from even this entire experience mm. with you. Well, I love that. Yeah. And I think, you know, and it, it reminds me, and I think to go back to some of this, like during our live Q and a time or live coaching time is, is really reverse engineer. Even if there's not a ton of people in session that day, just reverse engineering wins and struggles, because that's where all of it comes to bear and you see it all most clearly is in those moments. So we'll, uh, I'll make sure to focus on that in our next live coaching. Cause I think, I think that also helps just to see it over and over again in those real moments. Good. Thank you. Okay. Back to our text on yes. page 477, mm -hmm. they mention each of these orations on human humanistic education merits careful attention. I'm wondering what they mean by humanist education. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Modern so versus versus um, a person like Charlotte Mason. So humanist is a philosophy. So like, for example, a lot of classical educators would consider themselves Christian humanists. So um, the way, and I'm still understanding all the, my, I don't, I don't always like get fully the, you know, all the ideological terms or, you know, category terms, humanist, uh, conservative, you know, liberal, you know, all the terms that people give all the things, they kind of get a little jumbled in my mind, but based on what I understand currently, a humanist is part of what makes a humanist a humanist is they there's an emphasis on the perfection of our being that there's this movement towards cultivating virtue um like how far can you go in the intellect in the body in the you know and so this this emphasis on perfecting our being um in all aspects of our being uh, how far can you go how much can you cultivate yourself so that idea is the one that I have grabbed onto the most and that has stayed with me. I know there's more to it. C.S. Lewis was considered a humanist. I have like so many notes about humanists, but it just takes me a while for to like synthesize all that. But that's what I know and feel comfortable with asserting at this moment. <laughs> no, that's good. Thank you. I was just curious um, because when I looked it up online, it specifically said humanist education is different from liberal arts education and classical education and that's what wikipedia said don't mistake that this is these yeah are separate there's things, a so. lot of similarities though to be mm -hmm. honest and a liberal arts education could be a humanist education they're not like they can be the same thing um, but they do mean specific things and i haven't studied that in depth the the nuances between each of those words but Thank yes you. research it also, I would say it's like there's there's thing there's it's an interesting rabbit trail. I was really struck by that first paragraph in oration six. Um, just I pretty much underlined everything and I'm like, oh, this is every homeschool mom that I know. And <laughs> this is the struggle of every homeschool mom. And then the first line of the second paragraph, when he's like, here are the tears, here is the misery. And so I'm like, oh, so the question I should be asking myself if I'm seeing a bunch of tears and misery is what am what is my orientation towards my child and towards this subject? Or if I'm in a classroom, what is my orientation towards this student towards this subject and is it aligned with the nature of the subject of my student and and do they actually have the background skills to be doing this like he said or it naturally um hold on oh 
Here are the tears, here is the misery. When deprived of those studies, which are necessary for the discipline to which they are applying themselves, they advance not at all or only for a little when they, and then with great difficulty. And I was having a conversation with my 14 year old the other day. Um, we were at, sitting down for dinner and she's like, you know, mom, I get really frustrated when I, and I was just blown away by her ability to name this. She was like, when I don't have the skill to create what I want to create. And she's talking about art. She wants to draw better. And she's like, I have this thing in my mind I want to make and I can't make it. I can't make myself draw it. And it's really frustrating. And so we talked about skill and milestones and like that disconnect and how that's really normal and that's okay. And, you know, what can we do in our mind? And then what can we do in our physical body to then gain, you know, but it was like, it was, it, you know, this is why milestones are so important. This is the master coach. Like that happens. And when we don't innately know the milestones or have knowledge of the milestones and ourselves or as the teacher, then this is what is kind of our risk here. Because then, or when we're watching our students, sometimes I've seen parents or teachers or heard stories of parents and teachers frustrated with their student and sometimes they even get angry with the child as though the child is disobeying but they're disconnected from oh this isn't an obedience thing this child is insanely frustrated because they can't figure out how to create what they want to create or are being asked to create and they don't have language to say that so they just act out but as the coach, what would it look like for us to be aware of the milestones and be able to discern, oh, I haven't seen them do that. I'm asking them to do too much right now. They need some backup lessons kind of thing. Um, I think that sits really well. I mean, I can't encounter that. I feel like every day with just the hard things that my children are learning right now, like the reading or the math or the spelling. Mm -hmm. um, acknowledging our kind of like in this sense or if naturally inclined to these students they are often pushed into them without adequate preparation and related studies and it reminds me of this conversation i feel like it connects when we are pushing them beyond what is real, what what they're actually able to do at that time and stage, rather than recognizing, hey, this child hasn't actually had the adequate preparation or they just haven't matured right. in these areas and that's okay. Yes, and that's coaching for us too. So everything that happens at the at the home in the home or in the classroom is also feedback. And so we don't act, we don't need to beat ourselves up for that. I recognize the way I just said all that. It could so the the way that somebody could internalize that is, oh, I'm gonna beat myself up because I do that. Well, we don't need to do that either, because then that is feedback for us. Like, oh, okay, I'm missing something. Let's get cured. Let, when that happens, guess what role we should lean into. What do you think? Um, I would say noticing uh, stuff about ourselves, mm -hmm. the like almost being the philosopher to yes. ourselves. Absolutely. And our students and the situation like, oh, let's get curious. Let's get curious. What's going on here? How many questions can I ask? What do I not know? Where is the gap? What am I missing? Like get curious and make it like it doesn't have to be a tragedy, you know, it can just be like, oh, now this is my education. I'm, I'm learning how to craft, be better at my craft as a teacher. Mm. So one thing that this first page, and I think it kind of continues on, and I've wondered this in connection to some other readings that I've done or things that I've listened to recently about the arts themselves, the liberal arts, mm -hmm. is do I hear even in this section, it coming out that the liberal arts in a more analytical way of teaching them past the piety, gymnastic, musis actually came later, like in university or in later years. So that most of the education was really poetic 
knowledge yeah, and the non-analytical knowledge like even for young education. years yes grammar and musical education was like most of the children's years you're right yes if like the age in which they really started getting deeper into the liberal arts was older which is another reason i think why the movement is taking shape the way that it is is because some of the stuff if you really studied some of the stuff the way they did back then we would be like oh yeah you can't actually do that in high school <laughs> like that doesn't actually work <laughs> which is also i mean which is why i don't even try to do science in my high school the in order to do science the way like after the liberal arts course of study you're using the four causes with a body of knowledge that's advanced stuff and so you can learn about science but you can't do it not the way they did if we're wanting to be purists to the tradition so i think you're absolutely right picking up on that yeah which takes a lot of pressure off by the way <laughs> It does. And it, it makes me so happy to just know that we can give them all that good stuff and they can just have that play date, those early friendship experiences and those uh, poetic experiences for a long time. And yes. what is going to make them want to know more are those invitational experiences Honestly. even up and through high school. I feel like if they know how to read a variety of kinds of things and master the four basic operations they're going they can do anything they want i've heard multiple college professors say if they can master the four operations of math and they can read a variety of things then they're ready like even um eva braun she on um, the she's she's written several books um i've i quote from her all the time um uh, in her book um education in a republic um and she's talking about the mode of inquiry she's like the sole purpose of education is to teach you how to read that's it you're here to learn how to read and then she breaks that down a little bit further and then talks about the modes of inquiry which is really where i you know she's one of the people that have inspired my philosophy of how we read and what we should be teaching how to read and then simone vey she's like everything you're doing in school is teaching how to pay attention modes of inquiry what eva braun is talking about is another way of saying what simone bay is talking about we're learning how to pay attention in nuanced ways i'm learning how to inquire in a nuanced way which is a form of paying attention and that's what charlotte mason is saying paying attention we're learning how to pay attention over and over and over again in different ways nuanced ways and john mir Laws. yes <laughs> yes, all the people we respect are all saying the same thing. I think we get lost in the particulars and then think there's some other magic spell or system or thing that's different, but it all goes back to, to if we can keep that main category firmly in place as we consider all these other things and keep orienting, reorienting everything that we're learning around pedagogy, orient it back to paying attention, mode of inquiry. I think we would experience a tremendous amount of relief and we would experience more movement in mastering our craft more quickly. Um, this is another reason we developed the, the, the realms because there are so many things we can learn without a category or place in our mind to put it. It's hard for the human mind to take it and run with it and put it into action. We need categories in our brain to file stuff away. And for a brand new thing, that's what we don't have. That's why something we haven't experienced is so difficult. We don't have categories. We don't have a concept of it. We don't have anything to compare it to. And so it's all brand new. We have to create those categories on top of learning this stuff. Jennifer, this is so good because it makes me think, okay, just go back up to that introduction where he talks about mm -hmm. the selections and then John Batista actually explains it more. But what you were saying about the categories, in part, we need education because we are finite and fallen. Man's pride confuses his mind, 
corrupts and divides his language and disorders his passions. And I feel like everything that you just said about we need that organization like that. Oh, let's just keep going then. Mm -hmm. To address this threefold penalty, education seeks wisdom and wisdom in its fullest meaning embraces knowledge, eloquence and prudence. And I I just feel like you just said and communicated what he's trying to communicate in in this that the relations, the noticing of those relations, education is a science of relations, like the noticing of those relations, and then the importance of doing this method. Uh, what does he say? Basically, there's an order, there's a, there's a, basically, it reminded me of the piety, um, muses, gymnastic, liberal arts, and mm -hmm. then the sciences, like that, at least that's what I heard. It sounded like that when I heard him talking about the importance in order to do the sciences or to become a doctor later, you've got to have these other things that prepare you, the math um, and the, right. the doctor of human. And your yeah. desire has to be awakened too, which I don't know that he goes much into desire here, but other authors do. And I think that we can, I mean, Boethius goes into desire a lot in the constellation. I want to read that with teachers because I feel like lady philosophy is the ideal classical teacher. I want to read that. And I, I don't even know what it's about. So I'm glad that you want to read it. So let's read that next. <laughs> that. I love that. <laughs> okay. All right. What else? I have more things, but do you want to, oh, do you have any other things? No, I'm here for you. Okay. Okay, good. I, I have a lot of notes still. Okay. Just a second. Let me orient myself. Okay. I'm going to grab more coffee while you're doing that. Okay, so I'm reading um, the liberal arts tradition with a group of friends. And when I read part three or section number three on page 478, I'll just read it and it says, and if I say that each of you must search within himself in order to consider carefully his human nature, we will in truth see himself, he will in truth see himself to be nothing but mind, spirit and capacity for language. And they talk about that in the liberal arts tradition. So I'm going to read the, the section that okay. it correlates with. He's um, in the liberal arts tradition. They are um, talking about Aristotle and he's basically defining what it means to be human and how that's different than just a normal animal. And I think it's in Greek or something. I didn't know all the little symbols, but they do <laughs> translate it for us. Thankfully. Okay. You're very kind. So, okay. <laughs> page 45 on the liberal arts tradition, the newest edition, it says Aristotle refers to man as a living thing, um, possessing logos, rather than attempt to redefine these heavily freighted words, especially his word logos, perhaps it's better to retranslate. Now it is true that the Greek word logos lies behind the English word logic. For Aristotle, however, the word logos refers most basically to words, speech, and language. Um, this makes sense if we recall that logic is something we do with reason with one another in language. So they basically say, oh, here it goes, continuing on, it says language is not reducible to communication. Only living being, only the living being with logos um, uses language uses words to create, change reality, exercise authority, and lead men's souls. It might be more fitting to say that man is the living being that dwells in language. Mm -hmm. And it just, that's what it reminded me of um, when I read that oh, that's little a section here. Reorientation to that. Oh, it says here, so continuing on, it says, indeed, when he analyzes his body, so this is um, John Batista on page 478. 
Indeed, when he analyzes his body and its functions, he will judge it to be either that of a brute or in common with the brutish. From this, he will note that man is thoroughly corrupted first by the inadequacy of language, then by a mind cluttered with opinions, and finally a spirit polluted by vices. He will observe that these are all divine punishments by which scripture will punish the sin for the first parent of humankind. Anyway, the thing that stood out to me was um, it reminded me of the disorder within language and what learning and growing in the true sense of grammar of being at home in language mm -hmm. reminded me of that, of bringing mm -hmm. order to that fallen state of our brain. And then also about the <clears throat> cluttered mind with opinions that also reminded me of the truncated uh, truncated reason that they yeah. mentioned earlier um yeah anyway let's see here and then he goes on in the <clears throat> section four like the note i wrote is when he's talking about the mind and the words and this, you know, the scattered mind and the language and the connection between all those, I was thinking about logic milestones. And like, that's where I was really, the, the idea of thinking about our thinking really came most to the forefront for me. Um, it is there is like, we are on this journey of thinking about our thinking. And this is a great like, description of what the symptoms will look like when we don't mm -hmm. think about our thinking. Like, when we experience this in humanity, it's because we're not thinking about our thinking. I mean, I wrote exactly what you said. I, I said um, in that part four, it says to these deficiencies of language are uh, to these deficiencies of language are added those of the mind. Dullness constantly grips the mind. False images of things toy with it and very often deceive it. Rash judgments cause the mind to form hasty conclusions. And I said, that reminds me of you about making the judgments because our mind has been polluted with either a, the fallen state or not learning to do the logic of thinking about our thinking or noticing our thinking. That's when we make those rash judgments um, too soon. Mm. Mm, good stuff. I, I, he's, he is becoming one of my favorites. Have you read him before? Never. This is my first time with him. He's a guide. Oh, I love him. I am a huge fan. I just want to sit with him. He's like, one I of do. The, like my favorite authors. I just like playing them audibly and just sitting with them more than I even, and then just saying something every now and then. That's how I feel when I read him. I just want his words to wash through my brain. And on repeat, because, yeah. <laughs> because there's so many good things. I actually wrote that down on page 480. I don't, okay, I'm just going to read it. This is... Uh, it's on number seven. This is always the truest, greatest, and most excellent goal of these studies. Many choose not to pursue pursue them, but are rather moved by the false, the base, the abject. And because they are moved by the false, the base, and the abject, it follows necessarily that they apply themselves to these studies falsely, basely, and objectly. Yeah. Oh, that's like what my priest has been talking about. And actually, it's on my YouTube channel, too. Mm. Um he just finished his thesis called um, narrative repentance, true stories of God, self church and creation. And he's talking about this idea of the social imaginary, like what he just said here is exactly what my priest is talking about. And he's talking about it from a pastoral sense. And what his thesis is, is like, we as humans make up stories, not consciously, but the environments we grow up in, it all creates a story and it's how we interpret reality. The, the work of repentance isn't necessarily admitting what we did wrong, but being granted repentance, in other words, being granted a true story. And the whole idea is that when we have the true story of ourself, God, creation, we will naturally be moral beings. Like that doesn't have to be the focus, but he's like, but to his point, 
when we naturally have wrong stories, stories that are not in alignment with truth, or then we naturally that that snowballs and we see more of that and we have that same result. Like we can't we can't have one thing and create something else. We can't plant seeds of division and have unity. Division begets division. Unity begets unity. Hi. This is my this is my oldest. Hi, He's eight. Sarah. This is Colson. Colson, it's great to meet you. I've seen pictures of you. <laughs> oh yeah, he can't hear you. <laughs> oh, never mind. oh, because of the 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 headphones. So oh. anyway, you go out. I gotta finish. You can just them. turn those upside down, and then I can hear. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You muted yourself. You muted yourself. <laughs> okay. So I feel like I, well, I haven't, I don't feel like it. I've been trying to narrow or define that. What is the educational story that I'm telling myself? Mm. What is the purpose of education? And I feel like I'm just have these ideas and then I'm picking up little tidbits along the way. Yeah. And on the yeah, previous it page, it is. That's how it yes. goes. Yes. Oh, yes. Nobody just gets dropped the whole story into their mind. Girl, what you talking about? <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. That's literally our entire lives right there. <laughs> I mean, I haven't. That's what I've experienced. I don't think anyone just gets dropped the whole true story. That's no, that's I'm not looking a thing. For the, I, some I'm people have to fight the me if they think that's a thing. I will fight somebody. That is not a thing. <laughs> okay. Well then I guess I better, I mean, do I stop searching? Cause it feels no, a little defeating never stop to searching, say, but also have self-compassion and be generous. Yes. With yourself. Never. Well, I will just keep collecting my tidbits yes. and forming yes. and refining and but see, that's how you can have pleasure and delight in it is because <sighs> there's no, like I should have been here already, or I'm already supposed to know. So now I'm going to hate myself and be hard on myself for it. Yes. And you can just delight in every little discovery. There's no test question. <laughs> there you oh, go. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to try to take my own advice too. <laughs> <clears throat> it really is hard, though, because, right. you know, people, especially when people are, they actually are wondering. They actually want to hear what you have to say, but then when you start talking and it's like, mm, I thought I had my finger on what I was trying to define uh, what an art is. And even when I was reading the liberal arts this uh, for our discussion, even what the, the liberal arts are like, not what they are, the individual. I concepts of them, but more like what they are, what the, an art is. I felt like I was like, oh, I think it's this. And so I'd write that down in my notebook. And then I'm like, wait a second. I feel like they're saying this now, you know, yeah. it just was, it feels like this moving target. But I think if I know that that's okay. And that definite, not that definitions, you know what I'm saying? I feel like definitions are important. Words are important. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to communicate them truthfully. Yeah. Sometimes it's just hard for me to even communicate. Maybe I've thought too much. That's what I think. Have I thought too much about this? Is it really simpler than I'm, uh, yes. than I'm searching and, for? Yes. And we find the simplicity through it also. I think, I think it's part of how we think. I think, um, I think a lot is found in the tension. And I think that... I think there's a way, a way of being that when we lean into it, it makes it a little bit easier for me when I am holding the tension between knowing something new and being able to assert it and be like, yeah, I just learned this thing. And at the same time, also hold the idea of mystery that this also is a mystery to me and there's more to it. And like, 
really know that in my being at the same time that I'm learning the thing. And so the humility of knowing that there's a mystery here and there will always be a mystery and there's always more layers and there's always more depth and nobody has the corner on truth. And I haven't just figured out the universe, even though sometimes it feels that way. And I get to do that. Like if I can hold both of those things and have those be ways of being, I feel like that's the best. Like for me, I have found the most joy in that way, like combination of ways of being, because on one hand, if we don't allow ourselves to assert anything ever, because, oh, I could always be learning something new, then you basically have to live a codependent lifestyle where somebody who somehow has the corner on truth, even though no human does, tells you everything to do and what to think and what decisions to make, because you might be able to learn something new. Well, that's crazy. Nobody can live that way. But at the same time, if we go all the way to um, extreme certainty, well, then we become arrogant and inflexible and we're not open and we're constantly hurting ourselves emotionally. We're hurting our own feelings all the time because you're like, (gasps) I think I thought I knew this. No, I don't. And I'm having an existential crisis, you know, like in the extreme version of it. And so I find like finding a balance between them, knowing that both things are true all the time at all times, like with everything. That's so good, Jennifer. I mean, I go, I have to go right back to that beginning. Vico tried to hold on to imagination and memory and a world increasingly preoccupied with truncated reason. And I feel like there is the reason there is the truth there are definitions but even admitting that there is that realm of mystery like you are attesting to whoever you're communicating to Mm -hmm. that there's more than what you can see there's more than just human words and definitions there's more it goes beyond education and learning and the act of learning and even pursuing wisdom and growing in knowledge all of those things like there is an element of mystery to it Yes, this is why we need the East. This is why the West is not sufficient. The East helps us relate well to mystery. And the West helps us. In my opinion, I see the East as the mythos and the West as the logos, and we need both. Okay, so are you going to write a book about that? Is that what your your, your, your I'm sure master's like, class is? Well, I mean, this is, is why that, I create the curriculum that I do, that it's not focused on Western classics and why I take the stand that I do on not just focusing on Western European stuff because we need- I love it. Okay. I'm going to read this because I think it's lovely. It says all wisdom is contained in these three most excellent things to know with certainty, to act rightly and to speak with dignity. And I do feel like that line reminds me of what I have heard others say about the point of the liberal arts being arts to help you know to act and to speak Mm, yeah yeah it goes back to what he was saying about language opinions and vice on page once 478 he keeps going back to those three things he sees it as the solution for those two maladies over and over and over again I like how he spells fantasy too, by the way. Just I, <laughs> I noticed that too. It made me happy. Mm-hmm. It's like a spelling fairy with an I was gonna say just with an AI, but it's already spelled with an AI, but with an IE at the end <laughs> instead of the Y. <laughs> okay, so I have something on here in my little notes here about. Eloquence, knowledge, and virtue being in the center and the arts around them. And I, I, unfortunately, I did not write the page number on that. It seemed important at the time. Okay, the next thing that I have on here is he talks about Orpheus. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you remember what page that is? Hmm. 
Was it before or after? I think it was. What was it? Hmm. I, I can't remember what I wanted to say about that, but since you brought up fantasy, I did have a question, a wonder. Yeah. Um, when he's using the word fantasy, is that different from the word imagination? Is he more describing getting caught up in emotional feelings? I'll tell you That's what page in just a what second. I think based on the fact that in quotation, um, in parentheses they reference women um and then contrast it with so the the so deeply are they in gray okay well let's just read the section um having left child this is section 13 482 having left childhood behind the human mind which is reason begins to emerge from the mire of matter moreover we say that opinions are punishments inflicted on the mind because of original sin, therefore corrupted nature demands that opinions from these early years be overcome. And yet fantasy in youth is most vigorous. So notice the contrast there. What's it being contrast, contrasted to? And yet, so first, moreover, we say opinions are punishments inflicted on the mind because of original sin. Therefore, corrupted nature demands that opinions from the early years must be overcome. And yet fantasy in youth is most vigorous. Proof of this would be that when we are young, we make up opinions of distant cities and regions, which are later difficult to dispel and replace with other images. So what are you hearing in that, that he is seeing fantasy as based just on those sentences? What are you noticing? What I think I hear him saying is the idea of fantasy is very, well, it reminded me kind of, he's talking about it being somewhat of a stage. And kids, children, fantasy and youth, um, it reminds me of imagination, but different than the imagination that you're trying to cultivate i feel right. like right yeah absolutely it's but untruth like yes. it's not yes. untruth you're it's imagining things but imagining them falsely right that's exactly what he's saying so he's using fantasy like the made he's talking about made up opinions to him is fantasy and so therefore it kind of uh, which then this is the th one of the things he's trying that he's saying needs to be ordered is our opinions need to be ordered. They need to be right opinions. And so he sees fantasy as yeah, part of our, the thing that makes up opinions. I did put a big old H a ha in the part where it talks about the women. I was like, mm. like we experience this in women. <laughs> Um, that's just because you can't perceive it breath doesn't mean it ain't real <laughs> i'm just gonna that, but whatever hey question do you mind if we end 15 minutes early tonight oh that's great is it time to end right now in two minutes <laughs> yeah that's great i mean there are so many good things here and yeah. i just love that you give the opportunity Mm -hmm. for us too yeah anything in the last couple of sections this. you want to like bring up last fine yeah. mm, okay hold on let me get grab my page here this 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 okay. will be my last thing i only read the first section so okay. i just want to say this one thing on page 483 okay. and it also reminds me something um that i read in the liberal arts tradition Mm -hmm. um, and so the human mind is purified by means of mathematics and physics from grossness and denseness of thinking so that it gradually reaches the contemplation of incorporeal, I don't know what that is, um, realities and with an uncontaminated and pure intellect comprehends itself through itself, almighty God. Mm. Okay. That's beautiful. 
Are they say, is he saying, oh, the human mind will be led from the known facts of mathematics to the doubtful in physics and metaphysics, which seek out those realities which are true, certain, and thoroughly known. I have been pondering this idea of the power of these arts and the spirit because God created all these things mm -hmm. that they do something to our minds. Yeah. Like, yes, this is I don't, like exactly. that math can do something to you or that looking at pieces of art, like it actually changes you. I wouldn't, I don't know yes, if I this could is say the, that this they is make the... you holy, but they make you more whole, right? Yes, this is exactly what we've been talking about the whole fellowship. like. The liberal arts are the arts of truth perception. It's that organ in the brain that's cultivated. And by cultivating it, I then can perceive more truth. And when I can perceive more truth, I can take in more truth, goodness, and beauty. And therefore my soul is nourished by it. It is that you're, this is, he is saying it in a different way. That's exactly what's going on here. You perceive more reality because your faculties are more refined and therefore you can take it in. You see more rightly, you see more truth and the truth sets you free. Going back to what he was saying about the disorderliness of the fall within our language, within the way our mind thinks, how we perceive things. I think of my child who who has a uh, he's just more challenging mm -hmm. and I've noticed he you'd never maybe expect this of him, but he loves fine art, like beautiful visual mm -hmm. art. And I wanted to make that connection of I feel like when he has this experience and is getting to know these pieces of art and looking and so he likes to sort them and everything um, that it's helping just straightforward saying it that it helps his craziness like it brings order. Yeah. And that's what I feel like I hear in this that Mm. The disorder of our minds, the opinions, the disorder of language, even. And honestly, like his challenge is language. Like that has been a, a difficulty. So when I hear John Batista talking about our language becoming disordered and fragmented and it needs to be put back together mm. and that the arts almost lead us to help. Like, does the spirit, is the spirit actually working and actually helping to address and bring to order some of those things in his brain that feel fragmented or feel that come out in chaos or in behavioral things or in, oh, it just makes me happy to think about those things. That That's beautiful. That, I mean, that's the perfect way to end. I'll, I'll end with, I will say one more comment about that. Gregory Wolf, he has a, um, a lecture online called Beauty, the, Trans the Cinderella of the Transcendentals. And he talks about the idea of how beauty leads us to truth. So it's like the first thing, our souls are least resistant to beauty of the three transcendentals. It's like somehow, even though we experience the fall, we are still are very tend to be more receptive to beauty than goodness and truth. But beauty, like bring, and it's that when you were talking about your son, it reminded me of that. You might enjoy hearing that connection too to bring more. But yes, this has been fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for taking your time always. My pleasure. I love it. Okay. Talk to you soon. Talk to you See soon. See you next week. Yes. Bye. Bye.